Outside the lines.
Hungry? Come and be fed. Thirsty? Come and be refreshed. Lost? Come and be found. Lonely? Come and feel that you belong. For all are welcome in this place, and all will be fed and refreshed here in God's house. Let us stand and worship our God as we come together singing our opening song. that you are here in this place. We pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see you. Help us, O oh God, to open the eyes of our hearts to see others around us, to see this world as you see this world. Open us, O oh God, to your love. Let us know that we belong in your house. And help us to reach out, O oh God, to a world with your love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat and we'll invite the Kidlins to come on down to the front. Oh, we have a magic wand. I wonder if it'll work for me. All right. Uh, well, you brought your own kid story, I see. Okay. Can I have the broccoli, he says. All right. You've been well raised. <laughs> I've got a whole bowl full of vegetables here. I have, as you notice, broccoli. Want some broccoli? Tear off a piece there. Go ahead. Just grab one of those. You want a piece of broccoli? You, want to eat? you do? I'm impressed. <laughs> oh, I mean, broccoli. Broccoli smells funny. <laughs> Don't tell him that. <laughs> uh, oh, he's with Bush, a uh, senior that doesn't like broccoli. Okay. How about carrots? Would you like a carrot? No? Oh, would you like a carrot? All right, all right. Um, I have celery sticks. You want a celery cake? 
Oh, 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 another carrot, another carrot. Uh, I have some nice Brussels sprouts. I agree. Oh, you want a Brussels sprout? I'd throw it, but my aim's not too good. <laughs> another one? Okay. There you go. Who wanted the Brussels sprout? <laughs> you gotta eat it raw. Anybody else? Well, because you're the only one, I'll, I'll, I'll give you three. Oh, you want one too? No, <laughs> oh, they're going to change the name to Broccoli Bill, he says. I don't think so. Ah, an onion. I got a nice onion. And, and a purple um, thing. Um, sweet potato. Purple sweet potato, yeah. No, that's the way it came out of the store. And how about a nice uh, acorn squash? No. No. You like that? Yuck, she says. Yuck. I got another one here. Wouldn't fit in the bowl. Hey. Hey. Who likes turnip? All right. Who hates turnip? Well, not quite so many. You want some? Huh? Hmm? No, you can't throw it at your sister. This is heavy. I mean, this is heavy. Do you know what your house smells like when you cook turnip? I'll tell you, it's not pleasant. It does not smell good. Rotten mushrooms. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Yet, yet, it does rather taste good. All right, okay, so uh, any, anything else you'd like here? Uh, carrots, celery, onions? You, you had enough broccoli? A few more carrots? You didn't have breakfast, did you? No. All right, here's the thing. Just because you don't like a vegetable doesn't mean it's not good or good for you. Now, you look at that thing and it looks like something an elephant dropped. And, and I'll tell you, it took me a while to acquire a taste for these jiggers. Now, the, the, the butternut squash, it wasn't so bad. I mean, you cook that and you put a little brown sugar on that. Ooh, that's very nice. That's very nice. Same goes with the uh, sweet potato. We usually, we get the ones that have got the brown skin on them, but, you know, you, you bake that with a bit of brown sugar on there, and that's, that's pretty good stuff. Now, you take these little green balls of death called uh, Brussels sprouts, and there ain't nothing redeemable about those. Nothing. A little hollandaise sauce, I don't know. I did discover that they taste pretty good raw, but I certainly would, I, 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 disgusting when they're cooked. But that's my opinion, and other people think differently. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not good. Hmm? Yeah, I'm with you there. Bit, he says. Bit. I guess that's why God made so many vegetables. Because he knew we wouldn't all like them. The, the same ones. I don't know. They're good for you. And everybody likes different ones. But because you don't like it, doesn't mean it's not bad. And that goes for a lot of things in our lives, whether it's people, or schoolwork, or games, or... Now, I'm not enamored of schoolwork myself, but it's one of those things that are good for you, like Brussels sprouts. Homework's not fun, but it's good for you, like vegetables. Oh, here we are, you want some more carrots? Celery stick, a bit of broccoli. Oh, okay. Yes? Oh, you're ahead of me. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Let's say a little prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For the mystery and the wonder. For the mystery and the wonder. Of all the things in life. Of all the things in life. Amen. Amen. Whose father? 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but in the line is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, I believe we have a song. We have a song. Okay? We have a song. Okay. We've got some actions to learn. Okay, and the first one is when we sing love, we're going to put our hands together over our hearts. Okay, I'll let Beth demonstrate the actions. And then the world, big circle. Okay, and then we're going to, every child in every land, we're going to try and count them all on our fingers. It's not going to work, but we're going to try. Um, and then hold, to hold in your hands. Then praying. I think that's the last action we need to learn. Okay? Let me just check. Yes. Yeah. So you guys stay here so everybody can see you. Okay? Come, yeah. Yeah. Come over on this side so the mic will pick you up. Then we can hear you too. So. Okay? That's it. Okay. You go up to Sunday school, and I think the youth are maybe hanging out, starting in Heritage Hall and heading down to the ping pong area at some place, a point. So if they're not in Heritage Hall, then uh, go check out the ping pong tables, and you'll find them, find them there. Well, good morning, and welcome everyone to Wall Street Church and to our service of worship. It's uh, great to be here. Wonderful to have this uh, beautiful sunshine and spring weather, and uh, I'm just so glad. You could all be here with us this morning. Um, our, and, and just bid you welcome on behalf of the whole leadership team this morning, myself, Pastor Stewart, and our music leadership team. And just want to give a special shout out and thanks to Sue Buckingham for leading our crew this morning. <laughs> Abe is off at a music, a United Church music conference called Music Matters in North Bay. So uh, we pray that he has, I know he's going to be having like just an awesome time. I think he'll be back actually tonight, but um, so that, that's awesome. And just want to, um, Pastor Dave, who's not here, also wanted to give a quick welcome. Good morning, Wall Street. Pastor Dave here. Sorry I can't be with you this morning, but, well, actually I'm not that sorry I can't be with you because I'll be having a lovely holiday down south. But uh, I just thought I uh, couldn't let this day go by without um, saying something special to the congregation. Over the last few months, we've celebrated St. Patrick's Day for the Irish. We've celebrated um, St. Andrew's Day for the Scots, St. David's Day for the Welsh. And I couldn't let this week go by without saying a happy St. George's Day to all of the uh, English members of our congregation and just hope you have a wonderful time and I look forward to seeing you when I get back. So in the meantime, remember, cheer for the three lions and uh, have a happy St. George's Day. Mm -hmm. 
God bless you all. It's a pretty good accent, isn't it? <laughs> Probably some of you didn't know he could do that. So anyway. The Bible reading this morning is from Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 20. There was a man named Cornelius who lived in Caesarea, captain of the Italian guard stationed there. He was a thoroughly good man. He had led everyone in his house to live worship, worshipfully before God, was always helping people in need, and had the habit of prayer. One day, about three o'clock in the afternoon, he had a vision. An angel of God, as real as his next door neighbor, came in and said, Cornelius, Cornelius, Cornelius. Cornelius uh, stared hard, wondering if he was seeing things. Then he said, what do you want, sir? The angel said, your prayers and neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. Here's what you are to do. Send men to Joppa to get Simon, the one everyone calls Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is down by the sea. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two servants and one particularly devout soldier from the guard. He went over with them in great detail everything that had just happened and then sent them off to Joppa. The next day, as the three travelers were approaching the town, Peter went out on the balcony to pray. It was about noon. Peter got hungry and started thinking about lunch. While lunch was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the skies open up, something that looked like a huge blanket lowered by ropes at its four corners settled on the ground. Every kind of animal and reptile and bird you could think of was on it. Then a voice came, go to it, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, oh no, Lord, I've never so much as tasted food that was not kosher. The voice came a second time. If God says it's okay, it's okay. This happened three times, and then the blanket was pulled back up into the skies. As Peter, puzzled, sat there trying to figure out what it all meant, the men sent by Cornelius showed up at Simon's front door. They called in asking if there was a Simon, also called Peter, staying there. Peter, lost in thought, didn't hear them, so the spirit whispered to him, Three men are knocking at the door and looking for you. Get down there and go with them. Don't ask any questions. I sent them to get you. Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. The message he sent to the children of Israel, that through <coughs> Jesus Christ everything is being put together again, well, he's doing it everywhere, among everyone. In this reading, we hear God's voice. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <coughs> We'd like to share with you a prayer. will be on the screen and sing along if you know the song, otherwise just enjoy. the right you 
come to you. We come to you. With all that we are and all that we aren't and should be, with all of our hurts, with our pain, with our emptiness, with our grief, our confusion, our anger, our lostness, our despair, all these things, Lord, our joy, our hope. With everything that makes up life, O oh Lord, and sometimes that's great and sometimes that's the pits, but all of it, Lord, we come before you. And we open our hands and the burdens that are there in our hearts and we offer them to you to help us carry Because in you is life, and from you came life. And in you are all the answers to life, and the way that we should go, and how that we should do it. And I guess of all the things that we can pray and ask for, Lord, we ask and pray that we would know that we are close to you. That in all the places that we go and all the darkness that we walk through or the angst that we know is our life, you would help us to be very aware of your presence so that we, like little children, can hold your hand and know that we're safe. And when we're really scared, we can know that you bend down and pick us up and hold, you, hold us close. Help us to realize, O oh Lord, that we indeed are your little people, little children, all of us, everywhere. You have no favorites. You love us all. And yet, we live in a world and a life that knows a lot of pain and struggle, where there are a lot of things that go wrong, where it's tremendously unfair, and where we can be so hurt by it that it seems impossible for us to get unbent. Yet, 
yet we can. We come before you, Lord. It's just like the spring with the new growth, the beginnings of flowers and, and life around. We can begin again with you. Where it is that it's the worst, it can change. Where it is that it hurts the most, it can get better. Where it is that there seems nothing but despair, we can find new hope. This is who you are, O oh Lord. You've told us this so clearly in Christ, our Savior. And we embrace it. We embrace you. We reach out to you. And we claim your love and your goodness to us. That's great. It's just beyond us to know what this means, but yet it's not required that we understand it as much as we feel it. And as we get to understand the feeling of it, Lord, help us to be open to share it with others. Help us to be aware of those that we have missed or forgotten that live around us, that we pass every day, that, that we might just be able to offer some of this new hope and life that we find in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh! 
We gather in this church people of very different backgrounds and different abilities, but we are all called to offer gifts. They may be different gifts, but we are all called to give of ourselves, to give so that the world might know a little bit more of God and God's love. They might know that they belong. Let's pray. Holy God, we pray that you would take what we offer, that you would bless it, receive it, and transform it, O oh God, so that it might make a difference. Bless this church community, we pray, O oh God, that we might bring your love beyond the stone and the walls, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.
that's a great old hymn, isn't it? And I don't, it didn't make it into the Voices United hymn book, and I'm not even sure it was in our old red hymn book. My dad would probably remember, but so it's one that doesn't sort of get sung so much in, in United Churches, but anyway, thank you, Charles, for suggesting it. We'll have to bring it out more often. Do you remember that, uh, the show Fear Factor? It's probably like a decade old now. It was one of those all-time great shows where, you know, contestants were called to face their worst fears. And um, in the show, you always had a really kind of dangerous, scary elements to it where people are, you know, jumping from, you know, moving tanker trucks or, you know, jumping out of some plane or something like that. Uh, and then there were the, the just freaky elements where you're like stuck in a cage with snakes all around. And then there was always the gross out element of the show where a contestant needed to eat like pig's brain or, or, a, or a live, you know, cockroach or, you know, and the big hulking ones kind of thing. Uh, you remember that? Anybody want to be a contestant on Fear Factor? I knew I wouldn't be a good contestant. You know, ugh, yeah. Anyway, in our scripture reading uh, in, this morning, uh, Peter has his own version. He becomes a contestant on Fear Factor, at least the gross eating part of Fear Factor. Peter's tired. He goes up to the roof to have a sleep, uh, to wait for dinner. He's also hungry. Uh, and uh, in, during this time, he kind of has a dream or a vision. And in this vision, a sheet comes down from heaven loaded up with all sorts of sort of creepy crawly animals that he would never have dreamed of eating. And, uh, it, and, and he hears the voice from heaven saying, take and eat. And in this sheet, the, the animals are all, I mean, there's everything from like, uh, you know, maybe camels. And um, you probably know that in the... Uh, um, Jewish people have, have and had very strict dietary restrictions of what they were allowed to eat and what they could not eat. Certain things were clean, acceptable, kosher, and other things were not. And uh, so, so uh, you know, things like lobster didn't make the cut. I always think of uh, Lauren Elliott on the CBC He's, uh, he, he did a comedy routine, and I always think of whenever he ate lobster, I always think of Lauren Elliott, because he said, you know, whoever the first guy was to decide to eat a lobster must have been some jeezly hungry. <laughs> it's true, eh? I mean, why would anybody, you know, want to eat, a, you know, and of course we pay ridiculous amounts of money to eat that uh, incredibly ugly thing. But, you know, there were, of course, pork is on the list. Of, of things that are unclean and all sorts of other things that we wouldn't want to eat like vultures and bats which you know there goes my great idea for a fundraiser I think we should have a Wall Street bat barbecue it'd be low cost you know great fun just have to catch them none there this morning anyway you can check out the full list in Leviticus chapter 11 uh, but uh, these things were uh, described, the, the, the ones that are unclean are described as detestable and some of them an abomination to eat. So there was like a heavy prohibition against eating any of these things. Interestingly, there's some things that are fine to eat. Locusts are good. Bald locusts are good. Did you know there were bald locusts? Who'd have known? I don't know if the others are hairy or what, but, but you think about it. Um, uh, um, John the Baptist out in the desert, he was out there eating honey and locusts, right? That was kosher. That was good to go. Cockroaches are fine, or crickets rather are fine too, but most other bugs are taboo. Anyway, Peter being a good observing Jew would never have considered eating any of these things that were unclean and not kosher. And, and you have to remember that this takes place after Jesus' death and resurrection. It takes place 
after Peter has messed up so badly. You remember that Peter, uh, you know, it's after Peter, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane asked Peter to, and a couple others to stay awake and watch and pray with him while he falls asleep. And then just after that, P Jesus is, is arrested and Peter denies even knowing the guy for fear of being arrested himself. So after Peter has messed up several times, and this is also after Jesus has given Peter another chance when after the resurrection, Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. So Peter at this point is not gonna mess up again. He's made it through these things. He's been given another chance. There's no way he's going to mess up. He's going to stick with the rules, and he's going to do what he's supposed to do. So when this sheet comes down from heaven, he was probably thinking maybe it was some kind of a trial. And I think it's a little bit hard for us to kind of understand how radical a request this would have been to eat, because we don't have any dietary, any time, any dietary restrictions we have are on our own taste or for health reasons. Uh, you know, lots of people have very things that they can't have for health reasons, but we don't have anything for sort of spiritual or religious purposes. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that I can sort of get closest to us sort of understanding would be like, you imagine a big Texas stadium filled with Southern Baptists for some kind of evangelistic revival and a giant like open bar opening up down in the middle of the stadium and a voice from heaven saying drink up <laughs> i mean it's that shocking it would be that kind of a uh, what you know but we know that this wasn't really about food this was about people Cornelius is coming. Cornelius is a Gentile. He's, he's not Jewish. And there were restrictions on even associating eating with Gentiles. This was not about uh, saying that you can eat anything, although that was part of it. It was about God w welcoming people who were different. The Christian church at this point was young. It was like a little toddler. And uh, there, there really wasn't much of a distinction between being Christian and being Jewish. If you were close to Jesus, you were also likely Jewish. And so those, those, distingu those um, things that uh, distinguished them weren't, weren't, weren't so much there. It was very significant that Peter was able to change his understanding of God. You know, as uh, whenever we get, when, uh, as humans, you know, when we're thinking of God, it's just so big and so intangible that we love to create tidy little packages and little rules into which we can place God. But God doesn't fit into tiny little packages. And every time we create one, well, I think you better be ready just in case, you know, God jumps out of the box because there's a good chance the Holy Spirit is going to move and step out of those boxes. And I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing that Peter was able to hear that message and to change his theology, his understanding of God, and his practice, his faith of how he was going to, to, to share the gospel. And I think it's something that we as Christians and churches need to learn again and again and again. Every time we think we've got God figured out, well, watch out. We should hold our faith with open hearts and an open hand and want to follow God more than we would want to follow perhaps a tradition. Not that traditions are bad. It's just that one comes before the other. So again, this was such a radical thing for the early church to do, to step out and to include Gentiles into, into the fold. Um, but while it's radical for the early church, this kind of inclusivity, it's not radical for us, especially here in Canada. You know, Canada is this great mosaic. You look at the city of Toronto, it's one of the most diverse cities in the world 
49.9% of Toronto, people living in Toronto are born in another country. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? Let alone of a different, you know, we're not talking second generation, we're talking born in another country. Um, and, you know, I mean, the United Church of Canada, our denomination, is all about inclusivity. And here at Wall Street, our tagline is, God loves all, so do we, right? I mean, we eat this stuff for breakfast. This isn't radical to us. The danger for us in hearing the scripture that Eileen read is that we might listen to this scripture and say, oh, isn't that nice? and pat ourselves on the back because we're just so darned inclusive, right? And then go away. Well, we might stop for a second and say, well, isn't it a shame that that church over there or that country over there isn't it inclusive, isn't inclusive or is racist or whatever is. But for ourselves, we would stand there and say, well, thank God we're not like them. Thank God we're so open and inclusive. But I think we have to ask ourselves, how good are we really? You know, when we think of our communities, our communities are incredibly compartmentalized. I mean, I take my kids to hockey, and I meet other parents who are roughly my age, roughly my socioeconomic, you know, background with kids who are, you know, like my kids. And I go to, you know, the Y and I meet people who, again, I, I kind of go from event to event with people who are a whole lot like me. I mean, just look at communities. We have, you know, seniors who live in seniors' lodges or, or seniors' communities. We have children who go to schools with just, you know, children. Yeah, there's the odd adult. Or, you know, hang out at hockey rinks with just children. We're very compartmentalized in our community and in our own lives. We might say it's for convenience or, or comfort, but, but I think it's worth asking ourselves, well, how many genuine relationships do you have with someone who is different from you? How many genuine relationships do you have with someone of a different race or color, with someone of a different sexual orientation from you, with someone who is much wealthier or much poorer than you? How many genuine relationships do you have with someone who is much older than you or much younger than you? I think if we look at our, look at our, take I'm surprised at how few genuine relationships that we have with, with, um, with others. Do you remember the movie The Blind Side? It was a great movie. It's one of those movies that I think, you know, I'll, I'll have to just kind of watch again. It's based on the true story of Michael Oher. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. He's Or? Okay. He's a football player, an offensive lineman. Um, who was, who was um, playing with the Baltimore Ravens and is currently uh, signed on with the Carolina Panthers NFL. Uh, and it's the true story of his upbringing. You know, he was uh, brought up in poverty and going from foster home to foster home. And he ended up making friends with a kid much younger than him. Uh, and this kid's family ended up adopting him. It's, it's a movie all about uh, crossing lines, crossing lines of color, of wealth, of, of political ideology. Anyway, let's check it out. The clip, the trailer, that is. I'm not cutting, I'm just asking. Let me tell you something. All right, we have been sitting around here for over an hour, and when I look around, all I see are people shooting the bull and drinking coffee. Now can I help you? Oh, you first. Th no, you go ahead. I think I want to hear this. Me too. You're right. Excuse me? You're right? How oh, those words taste coming out of your mouth? Mike Vinegar. Who is that, Esther? Big Buck. He goes to high school. 
Costco fan. What is he wearing? It's below freezing. Do you have any place to stay tonight? Don't you dare lie to me. Was this a bad idea? What's the big deal? It's just for one night. It is just for one night, right, when you? Tell me just one thing I should know about you. I don't like to be called Big Mike. Leah, this is another one of your charities. We need to find out more about his past. He's been enrolled in seven different institutions. His grade point average begins with zero. He needs to do better in school. I'd love to work with him. This is mine? Yes, sir. Never had one before. Want a room to yourself? A bed. Michael's grades have improved enough that he can go out for spring football. How's he doing? I haven't quite gotten the hang of it yet. It's all really nice what you're doing, but don't be surprised if one day you wake up and he gone. I heard you got your new mama now. She fine, too. Michael was here. Tell him to sleep with one eye open. You threatened my son. You threatened me. Sandra Bullock. We're in the middle of practice, Leanne. Then thank you later. This team is your family, Michael. You have to protect him. Tony here's your quarterback. You protect his blind side. When you look at him, you think of me. Yes, ma'am. SJ, you're going to want to get this. Mike's the best left tackle I've seen in years. You're changing that boy's life. No, he's changing mine. The Blind Side. I said you could thank me later. It's later, Bert. <laughs> There's a, a great scene. How are we doing? There's a great scene in the movie uh, when uh, they're hiring a tutor played by Kathy Bates, Miss Sue. And uh, when, when Leanne is interviewing Miss Sue, at the end of the interview, Miss Sue says, uh, now, but before you hire me, there's, there's, there's something about me that I, I think you should know. I, I don't tell too many people about this, but you should know before you hire me. And there's this kind of, you can see, I mean, Sandra Bullock is such an amazing actress. She won Best Actress for this. And you just see the expression on her face. She kind of holds her breath as she waits for what Miss Sue is going to say. And of course, we're all expecting the tutor, Miss Sue, to say, I'm a lesbian. But she doesn't. What she says is, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> And you know it's just as big a bombshell, right? And, and later on, Leanne says to her husband, who'd have thought we'd have a black son before we'd even met a Democrat? <laughs> I think it's so important. Churches are so important for communities because they have the potential to be places where there is great diversity. Again, going back to what I said before, if you look around our community, we often, we're compartmentalized. You'd be hard pressed to think of very many other places in town where there is the potential for having old and young, people of different economic backgrounds, different racial backgrounds to be in one place gathering together. It's really important for community. But there's a bigger reason than just that. In a world of Ferguson, Missouri, in a world of, of, of Syria and northern Kenya and Somalia, in a world where there are such differences between, well, you name it, right? Between men and women, between, between uh, sexual orientation, between, you name it, the differences are massive. If we have a hope in the world of overcoming some of these differences, we need to see it in churches. In Galatians, Paul says that in Christ there is no longer Gentile or Jew. There is no longer male or female. There is no longer slave or free, for all are one in Christ. And it's our call to live that way. 
I remember hearing a talk by Bill Hybels. He's the senior pastor at, uh, at um, Willow Creek Church, big mega church in Chicago. Uh, and uh, the talk was about how, I mean, though churches ought to be like that, as we all know, churches also tend to be places. Well, you know, there's the black church over there, and there's the, you know, the Southern Baptist church there, and there's the, you know, sadly, that's the way it works. And he was reflecting in this talk about, about the great racial divide in the United States and how as Christians we need to do more. And in his talk, I remember him saying that as Christians, we need to be the first to stand up and walk across the room uh, when we see someone who is different from us and to welcome that person. We need to be the first to walk across that room. In 2004, I went to Wolfville, Nova Scotia for the General Council meeting. That's the big meeting of the United Church of Canada when delegates from across the country come to make decisions on big issues. It's happening this summer in Newfoundland. But anyway, I, in 2004, I was in Wolfville. And somehow that talk, Bill Hybels' talk about crossing the room, uh, was kind of going around in my head. I think the Holy Spirit just kind of reminded me of that talk because it was a bit out of the blue. Um, and uh, I was picked up at the airport along with other delegates and placed in a bus. And while I was on the, got on the bus, I noticed there was a, a native woman sitting in a seat alone and I was alone too. And I just, I just smiled at her and said hi. And she smiled back. Well, this is not a, like just a, just a kind of, this is not some big blindside type story, okay? This is a very simple story I'm telling you. Um, but um, uh, it wasn't a big deal really to sort of say hi, except that I'm an extrovert, but I'm a shy extrovert. And the truth is I don't tend to say hello to people that I don't know. For me, it was a little bit out of my comfort zone. It was because somehow the spirit had reminded me of this thing of reaching out to people who are different from you. And, and so I said hi. And through the conference, it's a big conference, there's like, you know, 400-ish delegates plus volunteers plus plus. Um, but I kept bumping into her. She would be with her friends, her native community, and I'd be with my minister friends roughly my age. And, and we'd just smile and say hi to each other. We just kind of kept doing that. At one point in the conference, there were proposals going forward around the apology to the natives and around the reconciliation with, with the native community. And um, I, I, you know, I don't remember exactly the conversation. Certainly people were lined up at the microphones to make a point and many of the pe native peoples were, were telling their stories, their just horrendous stories of the abuse they'd received in residential schools. And uh, I got up to the mic to say something. I can't for the life of me remember what I said. It wasn't long. It wasn't, uh, you know, in any way, you know, spectacular or anything like that. But uh, I just don't remember what I said. But, uh, and I don't even remember the, the big debate, what exactly it was about. But I do remember that when I sat down, that Native woman got up, walked across the floor, and she hugged me and she hugged me, and she hugged me, and she hugged me. And uh, I remember being so surprised because I thought I hadn't actually done anything to deserve, you know, this, this hug. Uh, but somehow, that simple gesture of a smile and a hi, somehow, a division that I'm not even sure I knew was there, a wall came down. I don't even understand exactly what was going on and what that meant for her and, and what all it meant for me, but I somehow felt that I was being welcomed into her community and she into mine. Somehow God whispering into my heart leveled a wall. That's what we're called to do as Christians. Why? Because God created you, and you, and you, and those people, and that person. And God wants each person to know that you belong. 
that you are created in the image of God, that that person is created in the image of God. I suspect at some point in your life, you have been somewhere, and maybe it's here today in this church, and you felt like, I don't really belong here. Our calling as Christians is to reach across divides and to say, you belong. God loves you. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would open the eyes of our heart. Help us, O oh God, to admit where we have fears of other people, where we have dislikes of groups of people. Help us, O oh God, by your power to lay down these differences and to reach across divides in simple ways and in big ways. God, we pray for reconciliation with our native peoples. God, we pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for peace in different parts of our world. And those issues seem so big, they seem like they have nothing to do with us. But I pray, Lord Jesus, that today and this week, you would whisper into our hearts to make a real connection of your love. Help us to know that we belong and help us to see how each person belongs. This we ask in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
In a moment, we are going to reach for hands or, or shoulders. This is really a symbol. It's a symbol of what God wants to do, reaching out to the world, reaching out, offering the love of God. As we go from this place, may we indeed have God's vision in our eyes, God's vision of this diverse and beautiful world, all of the people here. And may the blessings of God, the source of love of Christ Jesus, the love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit loves power go with you today and forevermore. Amen. Thank God it's all you need.